We're getting into a series here this month on friendship. On friendship. There's nothing else past that. <laughs> We're getting into a series on friendship tonight. And, uh, man, we really felt like this is where God wanted to speak truth this month. As uh, all of us are kind of coming off the summer and entering back into school or a routine or a job or whatever it may be, back into a place where uh, we might struggle with friendships. It's kind of easy to hide from that throughout the summer because you don't have to be anywhere. But uh, going back into school or whatever, friends can be a struggle. Uh, friends will make or break who you are. Um, you can't expect, you can't desire to be an eagle when you're flying with the crows, right? right? Yeah. And how many of you guys in here tonight want to be an eagle? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but something we're doing new this year at Journey Youth is uh, we're going to have a memory verse every month. We're going to have a memory verse every month, and... We did this back in the spring with, we memorized Colossians 1, 9 through 14. And uh, man, that was so powerful for me. I don't know about you guys. Maybe, probably none of you even memorized it, and that's okay, because we got plenty more of the Bible to memorize. But it was so powerful for me to have God's Word in my heart and to be able to actually pull it out at times that I needed it when I was at work or in a conversation with somebody who doesn't know Jesus or does know Jesus and needs encouragement. And I was able to go like, oh, wow, I have actually some of God's words memorized. This isn't just words from a book. This is God's words that we're memorizing, and now they're living, they're in your mind and in your heart. Uh, David in the Bible, how many of you guys know David? He wrote, some of the Bible, and he was known as a man who was after God's own heart. And David said, I have hidden your words in my heart. Now, why do we hide his word in our heart? We hide it there so that we know where to find it when we need it. If we don't hide it, we're not going to know where it is. So stand to your feet. We're just going to read the memory verse tonight yeah. together. Uh, and then we have cards to send home with you because... You need to memorize it every day if you're going to get it. And to incentivize it, we have for people who can memorize it, uh, we are finishers. This family is a family of finishers. Amen? We are not quitters. We finish to the end. We can do anything we put our mind to because we have the strength of the Holy Spirit in us. And we're here to support each other. I got you. I got you. Uh, what was I saying? Incentive. Who needs some incentive? This guy. Guess what? If you, um, we're going to go student or leader. Student or leader. Uh, if you memorize this whole thing, uh, 12 through 17 of John 15, you get a Journey Youth t-shirt and a $25 Amazon gift card. What? You do choose to memorize it? Yes, that's what I thought. A little incentive lights a fire under us. Yes. So, the first person to be able to do that, and I think for this month, uh, I'm not going to make you come up here and say it in front of everybody, because, you know, that's maybe a little scary, and we're just getting to know each other, but by October, you're going to be up here saying it, the, that, that month's verse. But uh, in order to get that incentive of a Journey Youth t-shirt of your choosing, or uh, and and an Amazon, $25 Amazon gift card, you have to come and say it to me uh, at some point on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or whatever. So, does that sound like enough incentive to do it? Yes, let's go. Do we need to make it 50? Sorry, we can't. Maybe next month. All right, so here's what's going to happen. I'm just going to count to three. We're going to read this all together. Cool. All right, so first, uh, John 15... 12 through 17. One, two, three. This is my commandment to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. John 15, 12 through 17. Great job. You guys are on a great start to that Journey Youth t-shirt and $25 Amazon gift card. And so we're talking about friends this month, and I want to ask that question. What does it look like to be a friend of God? How do we become a friend of God? Because Jesus here says, I no longer call you servant. I call you my friends. How many of you guys, this is rhetorical, but do you feel like a friend of God all the time? Not all the time. But Jesus said, you are my friends. Those of you who follow me and have put your trust in me, you are my friends. And um, I just want to start out with a story about a man in the Bible who was called God's friend as well. And this is way before Jesus, way before Jesus said that. And this was a guy named Moses. And you probably all have heard of Moses, have heard that name. Moses is like one of the iconic Bible characters in the Bible. There's been movies about him. Disney even has a movie called Prince of Egypt about Moses, I think. I've never actually seen it. But uh, Moses was an Israelite. Everybody say Israelite. Israelite. The Israelites were God's chosen people. And then there's the Egyptians. Say Egyptians. So you got the Israelites. That's who Moses is. They're God's awesome, holy, chosen people. He loves them. And then you have the Egyptians who are not God's chosen people and they actually have in this point in time in the story, putting all of the Egyptians in slavery under their rule. So the Egyptians are the slave drivers and the slave owners or rulers, whatever you want to say, and the e- Israelites are the slaves. So they're like, whatever you tell us to do, we will do it because we have to, otherwise we will get beaten, and we don't want that. So they are in slavery. They are in bondage. They cannot leave. We are against slavery in these days and in these times, but in those days, well, they were against it then too, but it was just a little different. So you've got Moses, who was born as a baby as to a slave mother, and Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh is the king of the Egyptians. They called, they called their kings pharaohs, like we call the president, our president, yeah. And... Uh, Pharaoh saw the Israelites as a threat because they were having so many children, and he said, wow, if this continues on, they might be able to rise up against us and say, we don't want to be slaves anymore, so we're not going to be. We're going to fight you. And he said, we, don't, we can't have that. We don't want that to happen because the Israelites are the backbone of our economy. They build all of our buildings. They make all of our money. They farm all of our farms. They raise all of our animals and make all our gold and build our pyramids, most of all. We can't have them rising up. So he said, listen up, all of the baby, all the babies born who are boys from here on forward must be killed. No more baby boys, because boys can fight. We're not worried about the girls, even though girls can fight too. I do not want to fight you, Justine, because I know that you work out. So (laughs) this is Pharaoh talking, not me, okay? This is not me talking. Pharaoh says, we've got to kill all the baby boys. Don't want any of them. They'll be too strong. So, Moses' mother is pregnant with, lo and behold, a baby boy. And she has the baby. And she goes, oh, I don't want Pharaoh to kill my son, right? As any logical, loving mother would say. I don't want my son to be killed. Yes. So she does what any logical mother would do, <clears throat> not really, but uh, she put Moses in a basket that she made and sealed it all up and put him in the river. Logical thing to do, right? She loved her son, but that was a weird thing to do. But hey, she figured it was better for Moses to be floating down the river and die and at least have a chance, at least have a chance than to stay in Egypt and have zero chance at all. So she was a loving mother. She did what she could. And of course, God's hand was upon Moses and upon this situation. 
the Pharaoh's daughter found Moses in that basket. And she said, oh, he's so cute. Can I keep him? Let's take him home. And she brought him home and she said, listen up, dad. I found this baby in the river and I'm keeping him. And you don't mess with your daughter when she comes home and says she wants something, right? Right? Right. You guys do that to your dad all the time, I'm sure, right? No. So she said, dad, I'm keeping this baby and we're going to raise him as our own in our house. And just a little side note. Uh, God is always the winner, and Satan is always the loser. Uh, because Satan and the Pharaoh, they wanted to kill the Egyptians, or sorry, the Israelites, and keep them under their rule. And God was like, "Oh, you want to play that game? Okay, yeah, let's let's try this. I just want one." He said, "I just you can ha- you can have all the rest. I just want one, and with one, I will save my people. All it takes is one with God." Remember that for each one of you, all it takes is God, God just needs one of you. Wherever you're at, in your family or your school or in your workplace, you might not have anybody else who knows Jesus in your workplace, but you do. You might not know anybody else who knows Jesus in your school, but you know Jesus, and God only needs one person to totally change the world. So, Moses gets raised in the Pharaoh's house, eats all the food, drives all the awesome chariots, and the Pharaoh pays for all of his education, and Moses is raised as a royal person, as one of the Pharaoh's family. And um, as he got older, uh, he began to see the injustice that was being done against his people because he knew he, knew he was an, an, an Israelite and he knew he was not an Egyptian. And yet, by circumstance, he was living as an Egyptian and seeing this injustice being done to his, his people. And he said, I'm going to do something about it. And one day he was out and he saw an Egyptian slave driver beating an Israelite. And he went, this is just not right. And he waited until there was no one around, and he killed that Egyptian slave driver. He didn't think anybody saw him. He came back the next day, and he found two Israelite guys fighting. Two slaves were fighting. And he said, guys, why are you fighting? Like, we are, we're family. Like, we're all slaves. You shouldn't be fighting against each other. And they turned to him, and they said, who made you the king of everything? Who made you the judge? Are you going to kill one of us too, like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And, and Moses just lost it. He was like, shoot. I thought I killed that guy in secret. I didn't know anybody knew. And now the Pharaoh's going to find out and he's going to have me executed. I got to get out of here. So, so Moses took off for the hills. He became a shepherd out in the mountains for 40 years. 40 years. And after 40 years, he was walking along and God appeared to him as a burning bush. Moses looked to the side as he was walking, and he sees this shrub off in the distance burning, but it was not being consumed. And he said, I must go see why this bush is burning and not being consumed, as all of us would. And he goes over there, and God speaks to him. And God uses Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt, to to set them free, uh, to lead them into the wilderness, through the Red Sea, uh, All these miracles happened, and Moses was called a friend of God. And I just want to pick up the story in in Exodus 33, verse 11. Thus the Lord used used the, excuse me, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. How many of you guys would like God to speak to you like that? That would be so much easier than like trying to figure out if that's God or not. Like if God would just speak to you face to face. That's the kind of relationship that Moses had with God. God spoke to, spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, 
bring up this people, and at this point in the story, they're out in the desert, they've crossed the Red Sea, they're free from the slavery that they've been in, and they're trying to figure out kind of like where they should go. They've camped out in the middle of nowhere. So Moses is speaking with God, trying to figure out what the next step is. He said, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, God, please send me now your way. Please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, and God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence, God, will not go with me, do not bring us up. I'm not going to go. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and your people? Is it not in your going with us? that we are different from other people in other places of the world. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, please God, show me your glory. And I, some of you guys maybe came tonight knowing that we were gonna be talking about friendship. And you're like, man, I thought we were going to talk about like how to have friends or like how to maintain relationships that I have or make friends or be a better friend or whatever. I didn't want to talk about like being a friend of God. Like that doesn't feel very applicable to me in my life right now. But you need to know that if you don't get this right, if you don't get relationship with God right, that every other relationship, every other friendship that you have in your life is going to fall short on you. Friends will be awesome for a time, but apart from friendship with God, you're always going to be let down because we're all imperfect people. We all make mistakes. We all have shortcomings and we, we're not perfect. And yet God is the perfect friend. So if we get this friendship with God figured out, if this, we make this as the baseline of how we, how we live our lives and, and maintain, our, maintain our friendships, our friendships are going to be a lot more fruitful we're not going to be as let down when things don't work out with friends. And um, we're going to be uh, able to be influenced and influence our friends in positive ways. So next week, Anna's going to be talking more about practical friendships, human-to-human -human relationships. But um, yeah, how do we become a friend of God? And uh, I just want to say that friendship with God changes the course of your entire life. Because we see Moses... He grew up in the Pharaoh's house as royalty. He ended up murdering a guy and then being scared for his life. He fled into the desert and became a shepherd for 40 years. So he goes from being royalty to murdering someone to being basically the total opposite of royalty. And then God shows up in his life. He and Moses become friends, and Moses' life totally takes a U-turn. Takes it totally flips around. Everything that he's been focused on for his whole life changes. Every, everything that his life has been about, and every vision, and every dream, and, and even what he thinks about himself changes. And we see, if we were to read on in the story, we would see that Moses, in the early interactions with God, says, God, you don't know who I am. Like, I'm they're not going to listen to me. I'm a horrible person. I don't have what it takes. And God just begins, continues to pour into him to the point where uh, Moses gets to where we just read and he goes, God, show me your glory, which is like the boldest question you could ever ask God. God, show me who you are. So your entire life changes when you become a friend of God. And Moses, when he was in Egypt, he tried to set one Israelite free on his own. Tried to set one guy free. And he totally screwed it up. He murdered a guy and everybody found out about it. And yet when God was in his story and God was the friend behind him, Moses set the entire population of Israel free with God's help. That's what changes in your life. You go from, from spinning your tires trying to do something big with your life, and it's just not working out to when God gets behind you, you do something bigger than you ever thought was possible. 
And so I just want to, I just want to like explain to you what relation, what friendship with God is like. Um, there's so many different uh, relationships that God uses in the Bible to describe uh, his love for us. He calls us sons and daughters of the king. He calls us brothers and sisters with Jesus. Uh, he says that we're co-workers with Jesus, so we're like sharing the same job. Uh, but he calls us friends of God. He says, Jesus said, you are my friends. And so I just want to explain a little bit. I've got a little analogy here of like what this could be like. Uh, and I want to use a friend that probably all of you guys have or, or will have at some point in your life. Um, so everyone at some point in their life will have a friend like this. You see, we can... You can roll that slide. You see, this friend probably every day. You share most every part of your life openly with this friend. The, the good, the bad, the ugly. You get a rush of excitement when you hear sound, when you hear the sound of this friend's voice. And you get sad and even anxious when your friend is not around. You go to this friend for advice and questions because this friend always has an answer for everything. You go to this friend for connection and when you want to relax and have fun, you're never bothered by your friend and you're always welcome a text or a phone call, even during class, in a waiting room, during lunch, and really any time of the day or night. You never have to make an appointment because they are always with you. If you've ever met someone who doesn't have a friend like this, you think they're crazy and are missing out on. Sometimes you can spend hours together and it feels like minutes because you're so lost in all that this friend is. Usually this friend is the first thing on your mind and the last thing before bed. Do you know who this friend is? Who is this friend? It's a pretty good answer. I like that. Who, who is this friend? Bradley? <laughs> you want me to tell you who this friend is? This friend is your smartphone. Got him! This friend is your smartphone. And I'm not, I'm not using this example to dip smartphones and be like, you guys should get off your phones because you're on your phones too much. But this is exactly what God is like as a friend to us. Why? Because everywhere you go, you have your smartphone in your pocket. Right? If you don't have a smartphone yet, yet, I'm sorry, but you will soon. And you'll understand. Being a friend of God is meant to look like the relationship that we have with our phone. He's always with us because he lives inside of us with his Holy Spirit which means that you always have 24-7 access to him. Uh, again, David in the Bible asked this rhetorical question to God. He said, where can I go that I will escape your presence? Meaning there's nowhere that you can go to, to get away from God. He's always with you. Jesus said, I'm always here with you, even to the end of the world, even to the end of the age. That was the, those were Jesus' last words when he left in the book of John. I'm with you even to the end of the age. And uh, in Colossians, it says that all of the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are hidden in Christ. So if we have that in us, we go to our phone to like Google like any question we ever have or look up any fact, right? We literally have that ability with God and we I don't even tap into that in even the smallest percentage that I should. God knows the answer to everything, every situation, every problem that you've ever had, every question that you have about life or about God. We just have to ask him, and he, and he speaks it to us. And I think most of all, we don't ever schedule time to be with our phone. Our phone is just always there, right? 
We're never like, oh, sorry, I can't hang out with you that day because I'm going to be on my phone all day. Sorry. <laughs> Even though you are on your phone all day, but, you know, that's beside the point. You never schedule that in. And you can be in class. You can be uh, hanging out at Subway. What's up, Andrew King? You can be in your bedroom. You can be sleeping, and you get a text message or a phone call, and you're all like, yo, not a problem. Like, I'm so not bothered in this moment because somebody's trying to get a hold of me. Not a, not a problem. Or, man, I just have this question. I'll just whip out my phone and, and type it in. It's right here. All I have to do is type it in. Google will tell me anything I want to know. You never have to schedule an appointment with your phone because it's always with you. And we feel like we have to, in order to spend time with God or be a friend of God, we have to schedule a time to be with him. And if we don't do that, then we're missing out on him or, or we screwed it up. And this is not to say that we shouldn't have quiet time with God, like intentional time that we set aside with him. Because with your phone, you can go home and sit on the couch for two hours and you're intentionally on your phone. And throughout the rest of the day, like, you're just kind of going on it here and there as you're going about your day. You're just interacting with, with people who are texting you or going on social media or looking things up. And you have those times where, where you're, you're spending, you know, two hours on your phone. But that's not your whole day. And being in this constant friendship with God, it's not meant... It's not that our whole life is meant to look like a Bible study. Like, well, I just got the good book right here. I'm just going to whip it out while I'm uh, waiting at the bus stop. Or like, I don't want to do my homework in class. I'm just going to read the Bible because, you, know, <laughs> you know, God and stuff. That's hokey. And nobody wants to be that. And God has not called you to be that person who is, who is just, you know, just continually praying. Sorry, I don't have time to talk. I'm praying right now. Like, No. It just means that we're constantly aware that God is right here inside of us. Just like we've always got our phone in our pocket, the Holy Spirit is always living inside of you. If you've made a commitment to Jesus and you've said, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. I need you in my life. I surrender to you. I need you. Then you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have God's presence walking with you wherever you go. Jesus is with you always, even to the end of the age, to the end of your life, to the end of the world. And just like you're constantly checking in on notifications throughout the day on your phone, you can be doing that with God throughout the day. Oh God, I'm just really struggling with this thing I'm working on. I can't figure out my homework. Would you help me with this? Oh sure, I'll totally help you with that. Sitting down to have lunch. God, I just thank you for this food. Oh man, that person over there looks super lonely. Like, Oh, maybe that's God prompting me to go and talk to that person. It's just a matter of being in tune with him. Just like you're in tune with your phone, you know it's there, but you're not just like looking at it all day. You know it's there, and you know when you get a notification because it buzzes or it, it dings, right? And then you just whip it out, you check it, and you go about your day. That's what it's like to be in constant friendship with God. So I think there's two things that we can learn from Moses in this passage of scripture that we read to become better friends of God. And um, I'm just going to read through them here. He asked God for direction. And God said, yeah, go ahead and go that way. And Moses said, whoa, if you're not going with me, I'm not going. If you're not going to come with us, I'm staying right here until you come with us wherever we go. Moses refused to go on ahead if God was not going with them. He was like, no, I'm just, I'm not doing it. After all this that you've done, I like met you in the desert and there was a bush that was on fire and it was you and you called out my name and then you empowered me to do all these miracles in Egypt to turn wa to water into blood and my staff to turn into a snake and for frogs to break out all over the country. And then we got out and, and we saw you in the sky as a... Uh, 
as a cloud by day. And at night when we were walking, it was a pillar of fire that we were following. And then we got to the Red Sea and you, we were like, the Egyptians are coming. And you said, stretch out your hand across the sea. And then the waters parted. And then we got across and you crashed them back in. And then we drank water out of a rock. Like all these things that you've done for us, God, I am not moving forward unless you're coming with me because of everything that I've seen you do in the past. And it's like this. Justine and Kira, you know, Kira, if, uh, if there's something going on, you know, we got a youth event going on and Justine's like, yeah, I'm not going. Chances are you're not going either, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You don't, you just want to be with Justine. You want to be with your friend, right? It's not about where you're going. It's about being with her. And you're like, oh, okay, well, like, what are you doing then? If you're not going to the youth event, or uh, like, can I come with you wherever you're going? Yeah, because it's not about where you're going. For Moses, it was not about getting into the promised land. It was about being with God. And he said, God, like, I literally don't care about the promised land if you're not going to be there because all that I care about is you and being with you. So that's what friendship look with God looks like. It looks like us caring less about where we go in life, less about the choices that we make, and more about wanting him to be in those choices and be in those places where we are. It's less about stressing out how to figure out our life, where we're going to college, or like how we're going to get through sixth grade, or any of these things. Should I play football? Should I not? Is he there with you? Is he going to go with you? Because if he's not, you better not be going either. That's what it looks like to have friendship with God. The second thing that I think that we learn from Moses is he says, after this interaction with God, he's just been saying, God, like, tell us where to go. What are we going to do? Help us figure it out. And then he closes it off with this. He says, God, show me your glory. And all he's meaning by that is, God, show me who you are. I want to see how awesome you are because you've done all this stuff and I've never really like seeing the fullness of who you are. Like, show me who you are, God. Beyond all the things that you're asking me to do, beyond all the places that you're leading me to and this job that you've put in front of me to deliver the Israelites, beyond all that, Lord, I find so much significance in that. But I want to see you. I want to know who you are. Beyond all the things that God is going to ask you to do, beyond all the things that we uh, love to do for God, coming to church, reading our Bible, uh, singing on the worship team, whatever it may be, going to youth camp, MYC, having a quiet time, beyond all those things, our first priority and desire has to be that we want to know God. Because we can do all those things and never know God. We can get so busy in all these things and all these, these rules, more or less, or activities, spiritual activities, and then we miss God because we've never asked, God, show me who you are. And if you had the choice, Justine and Kira... If you had the choice to have Justine be a friend who just did stuff for you, like would go to Walmart and like buy you stuff, or like, you know, bring you food, uh, whatever it may be, just like whatever you wanted, you could just ask Justine and she would do it for you. But you never hung out with her, never hung out with her. She just did stuff for you. Or you could have the Justine who was like, Kira, I just want to hang out with you. Like, where, where are you? I want, to, I want to know who you are. Like, let's, let's stay up all night and talk about our dreams and, and talk about who we are and, and the boys we let. And, what? So who is it? Come on, tell it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> who would you choose? Would you choose the Justine who just does stuff for you? Or would you choose the Justine who stays up all night with you? Yeah. 
Why was Moses called the friend of God? Why did Moses speak with God face to face? It was because Moses didn't care as much. His first priority was to know who God was. And in this memory verse for the month, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I now call you friends. And why did he say that? Because before Jesus came and died on the cross, everything was about doing things for God and doing sacrifices and making sure that you were, you were perfect and right and, and weren't doing sinful things and, and, and just being good. And then Jesus came, he did all that for us. And now he said, I want to be friends with you. So now, as friends, you continue to do those things, but that's not your first priority. If God is not in those things, if you're not knowing who God is, then you stop and ask that question, God, who are you? Show me who you are so that I can see you in these things that I'm doing, so that I can see you in this quiet time that I'm having, so that I can see you and know you when I'm here at church or at youth group or at MYC. Because you're not Jesus' servants anymore. Your sole purpose is not just to do things for God. You are Jesus' friends. You are friends of God. And your purpose is to get to know him and spend time with him and know him as you know a friend and then do the things because friends do things together, right? They always do stuff together. But the first priority is hanging out and knowing each other. So sorry if this was long. It was maybe pretty long, but you are a friend of God. If you've entered into that relationship with Jesus and you said, I want you, you are a friend of God and that is how God wants to walk with you. 